There are some passages in the Bible that teach very practical lessons, and this is one of those passages. We're picking back up on the life of Jacob, and uh, does anyone remember any details about Jacob? Was he always an honorable man? No. No. He was a deceiver, wasn't he? Yeah. He was a trickster. He got himself into a lot of trouble. Isn't it a blessing that God can still redeem us even when we have an unsavory past? Amen. God, with God, your past can be overcame, amen? amen? So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. He just got through with a problem with Laban, as him and Laban kept one-upping each other and kept conniving each other. So he's out of that situation. He made a lot of the mess himself. Laban made a lot of the mess himself. But Jacob is out of that situation, out of the frying pan, into the fire. So when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Nahanaim. Nahanaim. Uh, Getting that a little, that's a little difficult to pronounce. So... Jacob is recognizing that God has delivered him from a big mess. And he's starting more and more to, to, if you notice, more and more he's starting to look to God. He was very much not walking with God at all at first, and he's slowly but surely drawing closer and closer to God, giving God more and more the credit for bringing him out of a lot of difficult situations hope and pray that when God delivers us that we give him the thanksgiving, we give him the praise, we give him the glory he deserves. So many people turn to God when they're in a jam, but you know what they do when they're out of the jam? Forget all about God. Just remember a, a movie where this guy was lost at sea, ways off, and, he, and he's committing to giving his whole life to God. He's going to be in church every Sunday. He's going to give all this money to the poor. And the closer he gets to shore, as he's, his prayer, he's offering less and less to God the closer he gets to shore. By the time he gets to shore safely, I mean, he was a dead man. He was so far away from shore. God delivers him. You know, all he says when he gets to shore is, thanks God, doesn't change his life at all. So many people, they, they're, yeah, they'll be dedicated, they'll be, they'll be promising everything to God. They'll be praying and they'll be offering everything to the Lord when they're, when they're afraid. But they forget God afterwards. Praise God, Jacob is not forgetting the Lord. He is slowly but surely drawing closer to God. We need to give him the credit. We need to give him the praise when God delivers us from problems. Most of the time, he's delivering us from the problems we created, isn't he? We need to give him thanks when he helps us, when he takes care of us, when he puts us into a better situation. We need to give him thanks for in all things. He deserves our thanks, doesn't he? And that keeps us humble when we're giving thanks to him instead of uh, crediting ourselves. If we were left to our own devices, we'd be doomed. I hope you guys realize that. The smartest person in this room left your own devices, your life is going to be a total disaster. It doesn't matter how smart you think you are. We have, uh, all of us have a tremendous ability to dig a hole for ourselves, don't we? We have a tremendous ability to make some bad moves. So we need to trust in God to, to save us from ourselves sometimes, don't we? Give him the credit, give him the praise when he does save us from our own... I need to praise God when he saves me from my own stupidity. Amen? Amen. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And, by the way, I forgot to welcome our internet viewers. Welcome to New Life Church. We're so glad you're joining us today, everyone on YouTube, Facebook, BitChute, Minds.com. Welcome. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so happy that we're back to our Tuesday Bible study that I just jumped right into the study and forgot to welcome you all. <laughs> so Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother. Uh, 
How happy do you think Esau's gonna be to hear Jacob's back in town? I mean, he took a little something from Esau last time he was around, didn't he? Anyone remember? Say, say it nice and loud so everyone can hear. Yes, he took Esau's blessing, his birthright last time he was around. Yes, last time Esau and Jacob were in the same zip code, Esau was planning Jacob's murder. So uh, not exactly a happy reunion time, right? So Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. Now, get this first off. What should you do when you know you're going to have to deal with someone who absolutely hates you, despises you? Do you know what most people in the world do? They face aggression with aggression. If you know someone doesn't like you, you most people get ready to fight, don't they? They're immediately combative. They're immediately looking to, to have the bigger stick in their hand. That's not what Jacob does here, is it? Can I say something? Like sure. That? You know, the other thing, well, this society nowadays, if some, somebody doesn't get along with somebody, they just they, they, they just keep a grudge and don't try to get along anymore. They just, they, they just forget about the person. Sometimes even worse so. They try to ruin that person. Oh, well, yeah, that too. They try to attack that person. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, just look at some, I mean, nowadays, people think it's perfectly good to, to threaten to kill people they disagree with. We live in a dangerous society nowadays. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that is definitely true. Or at the very <laughs> least, they have to adopt an aggressive posture. They, they, they can't be seen as backing down from anyone. What does Jacob do? First, he says, thus your servant Jacob says. So he is, immediate, instead of trying to take the strong stance, like I'm mighty, you should be afraid of me, he's taking a humble stance, isn't he? Amen. He's looking to avoid conflict. What good is it going to do if he fights Esau? A lot of, lot of people getting killed? Have a fight. It's more than just a fight. Both Esau and Jacob had a lot of servants. They had a lot of people working for them. They had families. How many innocent people would die if they got into a big fight? Uh, a lot. <laughs> so he, look at how he speaks to him. Thus your servant, Jacob says. He's not coming trying to say, look, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the mighty man. I got dad's blessing. You should bow before me. No. He's presenting himself as less than Esau. He's humble. It's hard to keep your anger when someone's being humble. You know that? The Bible says, what kind of answer turns away wrath? A soft answer. A soft answer. If you know soft someone is, answer. if if I know that uh, Jim is angry with me, the best thing to be is be humble towards him. Yeah, that's true. Not trying to, I'm right, it doesn't matter what he thinks, I'm right. No, I should be humble. Amen. There might be a good reason why he's angry with that, me. That's Maybe I don't even realize what the reason is, but there might be a reason that someone would be angry with me, and I need to be humble. Amen. Not aggressive, not determined that my way is right. Amen. Because it's more important to avoid the fight. That's true. Especially in this case, people's lives are on the line. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants, and I have sent and I have sent to tell my Lord that I might that I may find favor in your sight. So he is sending gifts to Esau. That's a, even a step bigger, isn't it? Yeah. He's not yeah, just adopting a humble tone. He's sending gifts to Esau. What would be better? Having a big fight where people he cared about might die or giving up some of his wealth so that there might be peace? We don't like to think about giving up, giving up our own things for peace sometimes, but the Bible says we're supposed to let ourselves be defrauded, aren't we? Rather than have a fight, rather than have an argument, rather than have a, have a big issue. There's a gentleman at the church that I was a member at for many years, and uh, he uh, did some work on my vehicle. My dad uh, talked me into getting my, my car repaired by the gentleman. 
Well, the guy uh, fixed the vehicle and he drained the oil in the vehicle before he started up for a test drive and he destroyed the engine. Hmm. After destroying the engine of my car, he still wanted his money. I could have easily taken him to court for that. No judge in their right mind wouldn't, would not have told him, you need to pay the guy, you destroyed his car, I was still paying payments on the vehicle. But you know what I did? Because I didn't want to have a cause a disgrace to the cause of Christ, I let it go. Even when the pastor of the church, because he kept coming to me trying to get me to give him money, the pastor of the church said, no, you should be paying Larry. You destroyed his car. I didn't make a fuss about it. I didn't pursue it. The guy continued to call and try to harass me for years. He even showed up at the next church I was a part of. But I never once tried to get that money. I never once lost my temper with him, even though there was times I wanted to. Because it was better to avoid the conflict. It was better to avoid the fight. Amen. He'll have to answer to God for what he did. And God can deal with him far better than I can. There's nothing good I could have done by fighting. But there's a lot of good God can do. And I hope and pray that by my response that eventually, I mean, I haven't heard from the guy for maybe about five or six years. Hopefully the guy has repented by now, has realized the error of his ways. I hope and pray. Some, you know, the idea isn't I have to protect what's mine. Especially when we're dealing with our family or our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible tells us we're supposed to try to avoid conflict. In this case, that meant Jacob, who was a very wealthy man at this point, it was better for him to give of his wealth to avoid having a war that would have caused many people to die. What's more important, your money or people's lives? What's more important for you? Uh, that you get the $20 that you think someone owes you? Or your testimony? Or the testimony of your church, the harmony of your church? What's more important? This is contrary to what the world tells us. The world tells us you take what's yours and you keep it no matter what. But peace is a lot more important than stuff. Then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he is also coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. So, does anyone know why Esau would be coming with 400 men? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, do you think he was coming with 400 men to throw a party for Jacob? No. There's a reason you co he came, was coming to greet him with 400 men. He was coming with 400 men to kill his brother. That first round of gifts didn't work. He still is like, I'm going to kill my brother. So I'm taking my army. I'm going to go and I'm going to kill him. So what does he do? Conventional wisdom would say it's time to fight, right? So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, let the other company, which is, which is left, will escape. Then the other company, which is left, will escape. So Esau is prioritizing something, isn't he? He's not prioritizing winning the fight. If he wanted to win the fight, he would have kept everyone together. Because the more men he had, the better chance of winning, wouldn't, be, wouldn't he have? Instead, he wanted to protect as many lives as possible. That's why he split his company into two groups. He's deliberately cutting his own chances of success to ensure as many people will survive as possible. It's the most important thing for us as Christians should not be winning, amen? amen. Other people, the people we love and care about, even the people we don't love, the people that are our enemies, God says to love them anyways. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. We need to get it out of our head that winning is everything. Our goal is supposed to be showing the love of Jesus Christ. Our goal should be protecting lives, Amen. not putting them at risk. Amen? Amen. 
totally goes against what any military strategist would have told Jacob to do. Then Jacob said, O God my, of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. So let's look at this prayer here. First, in verse 9, we see he does a smart thing here. When you don't know what to do, when you're afraid, we turn to God first, right? Amen. Is that what we usually do? Let's be honest. When we're afraid, do we turn to God first usually? We should, but how many are honest enough to say they, they don't always? I know there's times I don't turn to God first. I should. But how often do we worry and panic and fret? Oh no, what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this mess? We need to turn to God, amen? amen? We need to ask the Lord to help us. He can give us guidance. He can bring us through. He can do miracles. Amen. That's, that's true. He reminded God, and God didn't need reminding, but he reminded God, hey, I, I, I'm following, I'm doing what you told me to do. I return to my country and my family like you told me to do. Verse 10 you see, he's getting it now. He's starting to get it. He knows he doesn't deserve the stuff that God has done. He's approaching God in humility. He's not approaching God, why'd you bring me into this mess? This is all your fault, God. Why'd you allow this to happen? No, he's not saying that, is he? No. He's approaching from a state of humility. I've seen so many people, when they get in trouble, the first person they blame is God. God didn't put you in that mess. God didn't cause that problem. We run into problems either for our sin or for the sin of someone else. It's not always our fault, but there's usually a sin somewhere, whether it's our sin or someone else's sin. Sometimes it's just at things that no one is responsible for. It just happens. Our bodies are weak and they're frail. But do you know why we have sickness? The Bible tells us why we have sickness. It's because sin came into the world through Adam. When it all comes down to it, we have problems because sin is in this world. It's not God's fault. God didn't tell Adam to sin. God doesn't tell me to sin. God doesn't tell you to sin, does he? God already has given us more than we deserve, hasn't he? The minute Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, anyone who thinks that God's not fair... Well, yeah, God's not fair. He's given us far more than we could ever earn, far more than we deserve. I thank God that he's not fair, amen? amen. If God was fair, then I'd be, I'd have a, a place reserved in hell for me. Thank God he's not fair. Amen. He gets it. He knows he doesn't deserve the blessings God has given. And he acknowledges that. He's approaching God from a place of humility. When you're in a jam and when you go to the Lord, do you approach him from humility or do you, or do you think you deserve God's deliverance? Do you think he, you're entitled to it? You know, a lot of the teaching out there, they call it the name it and claim it doctrine. I call it the blab it and grab it doctrine. They think they can just claim stuff and God, and God owes them stuff. No, God doesn't owe us anything. He, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. How in the world can we say God owes us something? He already went well far and beyond what we deserve. Amen? Amen? So let's approach God from a place of humility. Not entitlement, you owe us this, we deserve this. No, we don't deserve anything. But God, you've given us so much. You've been so graceful. I know you love me, Lord. Please, God, in your mercy, help me. Amen. He asked for God's deliverance. For I fear lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. You see, his focus, here's an important thing. Our focus should not be on us, amen? amen? As he's going before the Lord, 
He's not just saying, save me, save me, save me. He's worried about the children. He's worried about his wife. Are we remembering other people in our prayers or are our prayers all just about me, 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 me? How often have you prayed for someone else? When's the last time you prayed for someone else? I hope it's every day. And it's so easy to get so caught up in our own problems we forget about people, but we shouldn't, amen? amen. We need to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to remember our family. We need to remember our enemies in prayer. You know, uh, you don't like whoever's in the White House right now? Pray for them. You don't like our Congress and our Senate? Pray for them. If for anything, pray that they'll accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Amen? Amen. Pray for your friends. Pray for your enemies. Pray for your family. Pray for other people. Don't be someone who only prays for them, themselves. Jacob was praying for his family. Amen. Pray for others. Don't be self-centered in your prayers. For you said, I, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. He's remembering the promises of God. Remember the promises of God. That's important. Why should we remember the promises of God? Anyone, why should we remember God's promises? To encourage us, yes. We have a God who keeps his promises, amen? amen. So when we remember what God has promised in his word, that gives us strength. Amen. I don't have to be afraid. God's already won the battle. I don't have to be afraid because God already promised this, and if he promised it, nothing can, is more powerful than God. Amen. Esau can't fight against God. That's true. Yeah, Esau could do a lot of damage to Jacob, might be able to kill Jacob, but he can't, he can't stop God's promise from coming true. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. So now he's going to send another present to Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants. Every drove passed, every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. So what they're doing is setting it up so as Esau is coming to kill Jacob, he's just going to keep getting gift after gift after gift from Jacob. It's very hard to remain upset at someone if they keep giving you gifts. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this is one big, I'm sorry, Esau. 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 And let me tell you something. If you've wronged someone, it's okay to say you're sorry. Amen. In fact, you should apologize. That's, that's true. Be man enough to make, make it right when you're wrong. Amen? Amen? And you women, be woman enough to make it right when you're wrong. Amen? Do... So, when you've done wrong and Esau ha and, and Jacob has done wrong by Esau, sometimes you need to make things right. And he commanded the first one, saying, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, They are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. And let's keep going. I cut it off a little too quick so if you could put a few more scriptures up there let's uh, go to uh, oh, let's go to verse uh, no I'm gonna I'm gonna go to uh, 
Chapter 33, I'll get back to that part. I'll get back to that part next week. First 16 verses of chapter 33. Yeah. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming. And with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them, bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So as he approaches Esau, he is setting up his family. Basically, he's putting himself in between Esau and his family so that if Esau does decide to kill someone, guess what? He'll, he'll kill Jacob, not the family. This is, I, I really, this is really a big growth in, in Jacob's life. He was a very selfish man when he, left, when he left his home country, wasn't he? He was more likely to send everyone else out to be his human shield then, but he's changed. As he's grown closer and closer to God, he's willing to sacrifice himself so that his family might live. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. So the gifts, the, the apology, you know, everything that Jacob did worked. And instead of Esau coming to kill him, Esau's heart has been changed. Isn't that a blessing? That is our, should be our goal as Christians when we're at conflict with someone. It's reconciliation is the goal. Not to win the fight, but to reconcile, to have peace with our brothers and our sisters. Amen? Amen. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maid servants came near they and their children and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. By the time Esau got there, he's so moved by what Jacob has done, he doesn't even want the gifts anymore. He's just happy that the relationship has been restored. Amen. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey, let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my servant go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace while the, with the, live, which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and Seir. And Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. So because of the way Jacob handled this, how many people died? Zero. How much blood was shed? Was there, did anyone even have a broken bone or a bruise on him? No. Instead, they met peacefully and had a reconciliation. That doesn't mean that Jacob's not still leery about his brother. He knows that he uh, did his brother dirty. He still has some fear when it comes to his brother. But they were able to come together and have peace. Amen. And that should be our goal when we've had conflict with someone in the body of Christ. When we've had conflict with our family. It's not always easy. And sometimes it doesn't matter what you do, someone will not make peace with you. But don't let it be because it's your fault. That's what the Bible tells us. As much as it's within us, let us strive for peace. That's what the Bible tells us.
if they won't respond, at least you did your best. Not everyone will be moved like Esau was, but we're supposed to try, amen? amen. What I see nowadays so much in the, on the TV and in the news as Christians is, I see Christians are just as bad as the world at wanting to get their way, wanting to win, wanting to beat their opponent. That's not how we win souls to Christ. We win souls to Christ by loving people, Amen. by trying to reconcile, Amen. by trying to reach the very people who want to do us harm with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can be saved. That's how we'll reach this world. Amen. Let's follow the example of Jacob. It's not an easy example. It'll be one of the hardest things you do. I can tell you from personal experience, it is very hard to deal with someone who you have every reason and right to be upset with them and show them grace, it's very hard. But it's important to do so. Yeah, we need to show grace. We need to show mercy. We need to admit it when we're wrong and try to make things right. Do the best we can to be at peace so that we can show an example of the Prince of Peace our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your love for us, Lord. I thank you that you reconciled to us while we were yet sinners. You paid for our sins so that we could have peace with you. You sacrificed greatly to have peace with us, so let us be willing to do what it takes to be at peace with, with others, Lord. Not determined to win, not demanding our rights, but instead showing love and compassion showing grace even to those who it's hard to show grace to, Lord. Lord, that goes counter to this world we live in, Lord, but help us to base our lives on the examples you've shown us in, those, in your word, on the example you showed us of Jacob today, on the example you showed on Calvary's cross, Lord. Help us to base our lives on that, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.